good to have Susan. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> we are delighted to have uh, Heather and Susan here from Service Credit Union, and we're going to be talking a little bit about financing your side hustle and financing for ag um, for agriculture, for farms, ag tourism, all those sorts of things. Um, so Heather is going to kick us off. She's a senior relationship manager, um, and she's been with Service for five years. And um, you'll notice if you've been on our Zoom calls before, there's the ability to ask questions that you have in the chat. And I will be monitoring the junction and we will be answering the questions um, as we go. And of course, uh, we'll also have a Q&A towards the end. This session is being recorded uh, along with a one pager, which allows you to have this information. So um, without any further ado, I'd love to pass it over to Heather and uh, she can tell us all about uh, financing and good things for your farm. Heather. Thanks, Tannis. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I am Heather Karst. Uh, actually, they, Tannis gave me the Senior Relationship Manager as of December 1st. They changed my title. I'm now the Market Director for Business Banking, and I'm with the Service Credit Union in Innisfail. So uh, a little bit about me. I've been with Service for almost six years now, actually, and working in agriculture banking for about 19 and a half years working through both AFSC and RBC prior. Um, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about agriculture financing, some of the different options that are out there that you might have for your farm. And I am going to gear it, like it's very geared to service credit union because obviously that's where I'm currently working. However, I will note that a lot of this information is transferable to other financial institutions, so. We'll just move on to the next slide. So this is a little bit about our agenda today. Uh, today's agenda, we're gonna go over the different kinds of financing that is offered by Service Credit Union and by most other in financial institutions. Uh, as I know that most of you are part of the Open Farm Days, I do wanna add that your side hustles to your farm, uh, depending on the hustle, any of these different financing options can or may work for you. It would just be a discussion between you and the account manager. And we will end with a little bit about succession planning at service and what we have to offer at the moment, because I do know that there are a lot of farms that are going through that currently. So um, next slide is about our authorized overdraft or AOD. This is what Service Credit Union offers as a way of uh, lines of credit, operating loans, everyone's got a little bit different uh, wording around it. So the our Authorized Overdraft or AOD is our version of the operating loan. It is like a very large overdraft that other banks offer. It is attached to an account, uh, but it is priced more like a line of credit and not like your typical authorized overdraft pricing. This would be used mainly for your short-term financing so mainly looking for farm inputs, day-to-day -day expenses, the sort of stuff that you would expect to cover once a year with the sale of, of uh, your farm products. Pricing on these options are, usually, are always going to be floating at a prime plus option with a monthly accommodation fee, depending on the size of the line. So usually the security that most places will take for your authorized overdraft line of credit will be a general security agreement, which will have security over mostly your inventory. So grain, cattle, any sort of livestock product, um, anything like that would be what we would usually use. Um, we can also use land security and that would lower the cost of borrowing as well. I usually, so typically what I try to do when I'm figuring out the size of a line of credit or authorized overdraft for a farm, is I take a look at your last few years of assets or income and expenses for the farm. And I say that most farms should have between 50 to 65% of their annual cash costs for as an operating loan to help with the farm. So that's usually what I would look at. So if you're a smaller farm and you're looking at having, you say, $200,000 worth of cash costs in a year, then we would say you would need between $100,000 and $125,000 as an operating loan. OK, 
Okay. Our next option would be term financing. This is the sort of financing you would use for medium term purchases. So anything that has a medium lifespan, such as equipment or breeding stock, these terms can go anywhere from one year up to 10 years, and that's completely based on the asset. So if you're looking at cattle breeding stock, we usually say that we would amortize that over about five years, but new equipment, uh, new to three years, actually, we can amortize that over 10 years. Uh, just to allow, we know pricing of equipment is quite high right now, so we want to be able to put it in line with not only the cash flow of the farm, but also usually the length of time a farm would keep some of these assets. Um, pricing can be either fixed or floating, depending on what you prefer. The larger loans, if they are fixed, they do end up with a prepayment penalty, whereas the floating ones are completely open. We do try to set up your payments so that they match the farm's cash flow. So farm payments can be anywhere from weekly up to annual. So if you sell a cattle crop, like a cow, calves in the fall every year, that's your main source of income. We might say, well, let's set your annual payment for this loan for December 1st, something like that. However, if you do have, say, uh, income that's off the farm and you have money coming in monthly, we might say, well, look, let's look at doing a monthly one, depending on what the loan is for. And that way it keeps your interest costs lower. Um, another thing is that there are longer term financing options for quota. So if you are in the quota game, um, dairy, feathers, as we like to say, so chickens, eggs, broilers, anything like that, we do have even longer term pricing on and financing on that, those purchases as well. So that would be our term financing. We do actually have another option for that. So if you are a farm, say you're a growing farm and you expect to buy equipment over a you know one to two year period, you're not sure when you're gonna be able to find those pieces, you're just gonna be on the lookout for them. So we might look to do something called our evergreen line. So one of these, options of the evergreen line is, is for equipment mainly. So it's kind of like a revolving loan for equipment. So this would be a discussion between the farmer and their account manager. And we would set a limit, say like $150,000 that the farmer could use to purchase equipment throughout the year. Once the limit is set, the farmer just needs to find the piece of equipment and provide the bill of sale to the lender. And then we would determine the loan to value, the length of amortization, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we usually have a one or two page evergreen letter that kind of gives you the terms and conditions. And then the lender would either advance funds directly to the farmer if the farmer has already paid for the piece of equipment, or we can actually set up to pay the vendor or the seller directly, either by EFT, wire, that sort of thing. Uh, we have also worked out where if the farmer is going to meet the seller to pick up the piece of equipment, we can advance the funds into the account create a draft for the purchase and the farmer can deposit or deliver the draft when they pick up the piece of equipment. So this is kind of nice because as you use it, as you pay it down, it's then available again if you need to use it again. So you've got $150,000, you find a $30,000 baler, boom, you've got you know $120,000 left. Then you find a $50,000 tractor and then every year as you pay it down, that, that limit becomes available again. We do also offer what's called a land evergreen. So if you had additional land for security, we could hold that land as security as well. And then that uh, line could be used for anything that the farm needed. It could be used for down payment for land purchases, purchasing more equipment, or even a larger overdraft. So that takes us obviously to the next kind of financing, which would be considered mortgage financing. So at Service Credit Union, this would be considered our longest term financing, and we can amortize the purchase of land over 25 years. Most, most mortgage financing is closed, meaning that there is a penalty to pay out your mortgage early. However, at Service, we do allow you to pay an additional 20% of your original mortgage amount every year without penalty. So basically, if you had a $500,000 mortgage, you would be allowed to put $100,000 more per year onto your loan over and above your, your actual payments. 
That means that if you ended up having a few good years, you could pay this mortgage down quite quickly without a penalty. Um, at Service Credit Union, we do allow our account managers to do their own internal land valuations. We would be using the FCC land valuation for your area and your land type, whether it is cropland or pasture land, and then the Alberta agriculture as per the county you're in, and we would take an average based on those prices. So once we have valued the land, we usually do this for bare farmland just because we're not appraisers, we're not very good at doing housing or shops or anything like that, but we can do it on bare farmland, and then we can lend up to 75% of that val internal valuation that we have figured out. So once you have land, if you have land, you can use security, you can use it for several different things. You can use it for 25% down payment on more land, purchasing anything in any other asset, possibly even injecting working capital into the farm or larger overdrafts as well. So um, mortgage financing is one of those ones that kind of every, every banker likes it. So if you have it, it's great, but yeah. It's, I know that not everyone has the ability to access farmland as an asset. So I do want to move on to this next slide. I'm bringing this one up because I feel like this is, it's something people don't talk about very often. It is something that is fantastic for new farmers who don't have assets to use for security or smaller farmers where maybe they're, they've, they're higher leveraged. And this is called the CALA loan or the Canadian Agricultural Loans Act. So this is a government guaranteed loan. I've got on here that it's up to $350,000. $350,000 can be used for non-land purchases. I think it's up to $500,000 for land purchases. But this does allow for lower down payments. I do believe that if you're considered a new farmer, it's you only have to put 10% down. Existing farmers have to put 20% down. Um, slightly longer amortizations, we might be able to go up to 10 years where a conventional loan would be five or 15 years if a conventional loan is 10. And then the interest rate, no matter what, is always set at prime plus one. Now, I do believe there are some higher fees. The government guaranteed loan does actually do what it says, it is guaranteed by the government. It is one of those things that if you say have a side hustle and you're a little iffy as to whether it's gonna 100% work out, this is one of those ones where the government guarantees up to 80% of the loan. If something were to go sideways, they would pay your lender back and you don't have to. It's That's why I tend to say it's for say newer and starting out farmers where they don't want to basically give up their firstborn for, for a loan. So it can be a really good alternative to finance your farm's side hustle if some of those other options do not work. So next, we're going to talk a little about the requirements for fin financing. I know that, you know, having worked in several other places, this is one of those lists that basically every financial institution is going to need some version of this. So the first is three years of farming income statements. Now, this can be either you're incorporated and large enough to actually have a financial statement. So three years worth of accountant prepared financial statements, or like most of you, it's probably in your personal name and on your personal income tax. So once again, I would want, we would want three years of personal income tax with the statement of farming activities that your accountant would do up for you. Um, the farming, the statement of farming activities then gives us a really good look at what you're, what you're selling, what you're paying for, all the, um, all the different income and expenses that the farm has. And the reason we ask for three years is we know that farming is very volatile. It can be very volatile. So we like to take a three-year average of the income just so that we can kind of capture what the farm looks like with the ups and downs that comes with farm cash flow. Uh, the second piece is a farm asset and liability listing. Now, if you do have financial statements, that would be added into your financial statement. That would be the balance sheet. However, if you do it on your personal income tax, we would usually want something with a listing of basically what the, 
what the farm owns and what the farm owes. At Service Credit Union, we do actually have an Excel spreadsheet that we can provide to you so that you can fill it out. However, if you do also have, say, you use uh, an online database where you keep track of everything, we're fine with printouts that you can generate from whatever database you are using. So the next thing would be information on what is being used as security or basically what is being purchased. So if you're purchasing equipment, we would need the bill of sale so that we have the VIN number and make model year, all the pertinent information for the piece of equipment we would be taking as security or the bill of sale for the land you're be that's being purchased. We do understand that some land being purchased is between family. So you might not have an actual bill of sale or offer to purchase between, you know, if it's father to son or mother to daughter, whatever, whatever your scenario is, we would just need some basic information about the piece of land. So we would usually say the tax assessment, latest tax assessment, and some information about how many acres are cultivated, how many acres are pasture, you know, how many acres in total, that sort of information so we can complete our internal valuation. And then if you are looking to finance, say, inventory, you know, you're wanting one of those authorized overdrafts that would be captured within that farm asset and liability listing, where you would then break down uh, crop on hand, possibly even um, feed on hand, any uh, prepaid inputs for the, for the farm, and then any livestock market and breeding. I do want to note that if you happen to be going into your bank, say, in the middle of July, it doesn't hurt to come in possibly with what you have planted or even possibly your AFSC crop insurance form. I know there are lots of places that, you know, if it's the middle of July, you probably don't have a lot on hand. Um, or if you're a cattle farmer, most of your calves are small. Um, so we would just take kind of a picture of what was happening right now, because obviously if you have crop insurance, that means if there was a total wreck, that crop insurance would pay you out a specific amount, and some places will use that as your inventory listing at that point. So also we would usually ask that you provide, if you're incorporated, a personal net worth statement. We usually will have everyone sign a personal net worth statement. It, uh, it kind of does capture at the bottom that you're allowing us to look at your finance financing, which includes pulling credit bureaus and personal property registry forms. So I do want to just have a quick discussion about succession with service. I know that succession is top of mind for a lot of people right now. We have a lot of farmers that are they're either looking to sell their business or they're looking to have children or employees take over the business and service does recognize that. So over the past year and a half, we have been developing a partnership with our wealth partners uh, to offer conversations, I guess. It, you don't necessarily need to have anything, any cash that you want to invest at this time or even any investments at all. It's more a case of, we know that succession planning is not the easiest and every farm succession is different. So we would sit down with a business banker in your area and a wealth partner in your area to discuss your plan and just kind of come up with some next steps as to how to best move forward with that succession plan. So it's, it's a really great conversation. Um, they bring in both, when we have both the business banker and the wealth advisor there, you know, there's some great conversations about many different aspects. We have a few that we've been working with. We would then, where we would actually then meet with, say, your accountant as well to go over tax implications, because obviously we're bankers, we're not accountants. There's, a, there's definitely tax implications with the succession planning and everything like that. And like I said, we try to look at everything individually. We offer you options as every farm and plan are different. So we also like to say that we like to try to have information and, and relationships with both generations because we want to look at this as the farm as a whole. I know there's been places where maybe the, the children have gone in to get their first loan, but because they're new to lending or, you know, they don't have a lot, you know, 
a lot of assets, they've been turned away. I, or a lot of, a lot of people at Service Credit Union like to look at it as a farm. You know, we just have a different person running the farm, but the farm as a whole will probably stay the same. So we, if we have that relationship where we're coming in and meeting with the parents and the children and going over everything together, that does allow us to kind of see the farm as a whole and, and help with that moving forward so that we're not dropping the ball on the child because they're young and still growing. So hopefully that wasn't too quick and you guys were able to, uh, to get everything you needed out of that, but that is the end of my presentation. Uh, myself and Susan are open to questions. And I also wanted to let everyone know, even though that we're in central Alberta, we do, I, I would be able to um, refer you to someone in your area if you were to let me know where you're located and then I could make sure you're in touch with the relationship manager that is closest to you. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I do. I have a couple of questions that have come in, and, and I'll ask everyone to use the uh, group chat. So feel free to send the questions to to everybody so that they can kind of follow along. Um, for the Cala loan um, through government, um, it was it can go to multiple different kind of purposes. So there's, yeah, okay. Um, so my question for that is, if you've got uh, sort of a multi-generational family and you've got somebody that is starting a new business on the family farm, um, how tied to the land is it as opposed to a new venture? Um, and that, the, the question is really about sort of starting an agritourism business on a farm that is actually um, that ha that's being farmed. So they're yeah. starting a brand new business. So um, yeah, I just want to clarify. So they're starting a business on say family land, but they not necessarily the owners of the land. Yes. Yes. So Calhoun actually works great for that. It is something that we do not have to have it tied to the land. The only thing we tend to do with the government guaranteed loans would be that we would need something from the the renter, I guess, or the rentee, yeah. just basically like a landlord consent form so that if something were to happen, we could come onto their land to seize those assets sort of thing. So, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And we have another question. Somebody is looking to upgrade a barn to use it for, um, for dinners and obviously other events and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But the land is owned by the parents. So... Yeah. Is that something that the, the Kala would actually work for as well? Yeah. Because it's interesting in that, because technically it's on the land that would be owned then, in this case, I'm assuming by the parents yeah. um, or a different generation. So, Yeah, we did something similar to that. We did it because it wasn't a farm and it wasn't a farm business, but it was on an, an acreage. We did something similar on the others. Because there's a government guaranteed loan for farmers and then there's a government guaranteed loan for business owners so sometimes there could be you know maybe the new business on the farm is going to be more for the government guaranteed loan on the other side but 100 percent the cal loan or the government guaranteed loan would work great for that because once again we find a lot of the reason the government guaranteed loan is in place is to allow young and new people to get into business without having those assets needed by other financial institutions to finance it. So right. we, get a lot of, like we do a lot of government guaranteed loans for people who are renting a space to run their business. Now, obviously, if you're going to rent a place and you're doing renovations to someone else's building, I can't hold that building with security. But the government guaranteed loan then allows me to say, well, I've got the lender feels more comfortable because they have the guarantee from the government that would right. cover 80% of the loan amount if something were to happen. So, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, and we've got another question. How can we find more information on the government loan option? Um, we've got a one pager that's going to come out along with the recording for this. And okay. it has links to that information. So that'll yeah. all be included. Susan's actually put up a link to the Government of Canada CALA website as well. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. No problem. All right. So um, do we have any other any other questions? 
All right. So when this information comes out, um, you'll have uh, some information on how to get in touch directly with Heather. So feel free um, to take your conversations offline, um, to read some of the resources and take a look at some of the links that we share with you. Um, but we hope that this sort of helps get you thinking about how you can access um, some different funds and different different programs and stuff that are out there that you might be eligible for that might help you with that. Um, thank you so much, Heather and Susan. I absolutely appreciate you being here today. And um, our next um, our next session will be coming up in January, and it'll be all about the host resources. So you'll be able to join us and figure out how to network and manage your way around the back end of the Open Farm Days website. Um, but I'll give a couple more questions or seconds in case anyone else has any questions they were madly wanting to get out. No. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a lovely holiday season. And I uh, will look forward to seeing everybody in January. Thank you. Thank you.